I don't, I don't necessarily have power to stop evictions. I mean, that's between landlords and tenants. Okay, and that's, that's sort of um, an impairment of contract that's beyond the scope of what I have to do. Um, in terms of what you would call social safety net issues, we'll, we'll lump them broadly in those categories. Um, certain power companies, for instance, DTE, have hardship funds that people can contribute to. Um, but the broad sort of social safety net issues you're talking about, you know, those are within the purview of the ordinary course of the city, their work programs. I will say this from my perspective. Many of the operations that the city engaged in for years and years and years, and whether it's, you know, people can make an argument for the 13th check. Um, it gives people money at a time that they most need it to celebrate uh, the holiday season and also to pay for heating. But it ruined the pension fund. So my question would be the people who say that, I'd ask them, do you want to continue to engage in practices that ultimately come home to roost and ruin your financial viability going forward, or do you want to address some of those practices so that won't happen? You can continue doing what you're doing, but well, then a city of 700,000 can go to a city of 550. Well. Majority of, no, the majority of pensioners don't live in the city of Detroit. In fact, many of them live outside the state of Michigan, first of all. So I heard on a radio show the other day, someone said, oh, we're going to cut 200,000 pensioners. There are 10,000 city, 9,300 employees, and there are 20,000 retirees, and there's 700,000 residents who are getting some standards. So let's just, let's just deal with the facts. There are not 200,000 pensioners. Um, secondly, the uh, majority don't live here. The majority of people in this city when asked is crime, public transportation, and services. Okay. We've tried, even against that backdrop, we have tried to be very, very careful with pensions. My plan could have said, we're going to assess the fair market value of both the general services pension fund and police and fire pension fund, and then everybody's pension will be dependent upon that fair market value. And there are a lot of people in other quarters who say that's what's fair because that's what the pension, mm -hmm. they've taken that 1.5 billion in 2005 and put it in Standard & Poor's Index over the past X number of years, they would have more than enough money to pay those pensions out, they didn't. 30% of the funds that were invested in GRS were invested in private equity, real estate, direct investment for which they received no professional pension advice. Um, hundreds of millions of dollars, tens of millions if not hundreds of millions of dollars has gone missing. So when Judge Rosen came in with his funds, mm -hmm. that helped us rationalize the fund. What we propose in police and fire is that we will pay 94% of what they're owed. I've never been involved in any restructuring, bankruptcy, out of court, where any claimant gets 94%. And for the general services fund, what we propose is two things. One, to pay them 72% of what they're owed, but also to have part of the state's contribution act as a social safety net so that 138% of the poverty level will be the cutoff for any pensions. So when people pensions that were going to drive people into poverty, we tried very carefully not to do that. I've done that at some risk. Um, as I said before, my plan uh, has a differential between what we're paying unsecured creditors. Everybody says you're not hitting the banks. I'm taking away 80% of what they're owed. I'm paying them 20 cents on the dollar, and they're living. Okay, they're going to sue, and they're going to appeal. They're going to go to the Supreme Court. They're going to talk about impairment of contract. They're going to talk about Fifth Amendment constitutional taking. I'll tell you what they're going to do. They're going to try to defeat this plan because their view is they'd rather take that money. And I've tried to restore it. Okay. On the balance sheet side, if we make the balance sheet work for the city, and we can get bus running running on time, buses running on time. That means that citizens can get to their jobs on time, but facilitates their economic viability, as opposed to getting docked for pay, having to miss a bus, yeah. not getting in, picking up their kid late from school, especially in the winter months when it's dark outside. Those are very human things. So one, just for example, the financial aspect has a direct relationship of safety and security. That means people like my mother, 83-year-old, can come up at their house when the door is banged open and feel that the police can hear the sirens on the way, as opposed to saying, I've got to wait for an hour and a half because nobody's coming. So that has to be number two. If we're able to relieve some of the debt service so that we can deal with the city's functions, then the city gets over $300 million in federal grants. CDBG funding, Section 108 for housing, uh, we get hardest hit funds, uh, uh, NSP funds, we get a number of different programs. You'll then have the ability that people will not historically, and those funds have been goofy in, in past mm -hmm. years, okay? Mayors have used them, and city councils have used them perhaps inappropriately. 
One of the things we did last year is we took out the funds for IPH, which was the healthcare system, and put them into a separate organization so they'd have a dedicated fund to be able to get those services out. If you're able to relieve the city of some of its financial obligations, you'll have more ability to use grant funding to deal with some of those human issues. And in particular, this is what I would say to people, look at CDBG in terms of HUD funding is more flexible than any others. If you have people getting their lights cut off and other things, their flexibility within the funding regimen to address those human dimension issues, including infant mortality, low infant birth work, um, uh, uh, early childhood education, uh, secondary education, all those things, if you're able to get the balance sheet right, it all flows from that. And finally, mm -hmm. what I would say, and the third thing is, and let's, let's not be lost on this, you know, at some point, I've got to return the city back to the regular order. That's why I, I delegated authority, because I wanted people, muscle memory, people to get used to regular yeah. order. I recognize yeah. it's exceptional, I recognize it's traumatic, mm -hmm. people are embarrassed, they're upset, they view it as a deprivation of democracy, mm -hmm. all this other kind of stuff. But it's, it's not, it's a receivership for a year and a half to deal with issues that have been coming here for 60 years. 60 years mm -hmm. we've been coming. If we're able to do that, you will then have a mayor and a city council that have the best balance sheet that a mayor has had in 50 years. And some of the very issues that you're concerned about are going to have to be addressed by your elected leaders, because that's their job. I think you're talking about the price fix. It's in New York. Yeah, yeah the price fix you're talking about. Um, Christie's actually uh, did not have to plead. But the other thing is there there are two houses in the world that do this work. Yeah. Sotheby's and, and Christie's. Christie's. Yeah. Christie's is about two and a half times larger than Sotheby's. Mm -hmm. We got the best organization. I originally had them come in. I came in in March of 2013. I had to come in in April. Then I pushed them away because it was so volatile. And what yeah. I said for nine months is DIA has got to find a way to save itself. Otherwise, we were going to be selling art. Mm -hmm. okay? And as a fiduciary, under 436 in Chapter 9, I had an obligation to account for all the assets of the city. And the reality is the city only had a few assets that had any real value. Mm -hmm. It wasn't Colton Lung Airport. It wasn't city-owned buildings, city-owned no, land. No, no. It wasn't parking. It was DWSD. It was uh, DIA. And it was Belle Isle, uh -huh. which was a park. I was getting, I was weekly, I was getting on average about five proposals to develop Belle Isle into a gated community. Yeah. They wanted to take the north end where the golf course is, wall it off, yeah. um, and use the uh, use the casino as a country club. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, you, you guys think you're angry with me now? Imagine what it would have been like if I said this is going to be an, an enclave, another sundown city for the for the wealthy again. So I said, let's get that off the table, because otherwise, that's a thousand acres of pristine land, remarkably historical. The same person, uh, the same firm that designed the Supreme Court building, designed the fountain. James Law Olmsted or did Central Park did the park. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a historical jewel in the city. Let's protect it. And the same thing with DIA. I kept saying, you know, they've got to find a way to save themselves or I'm going to have to take it up. Fortunately, I think they did. They went out and found roughly $820 million. That's never been done before. $350 for the state settlement, $100 million for DIA benefactors, and $350, $365 million from uh, foundations, some of whom have board members who are cautioning them against against the moral hazard of making that contribution. And some of those very board members are hearing from some of our creditors who say, don't you dare do it. Let's force them to sell all the assets of the city. Mm -hmm. So Darren Walker of Ford uh, led this group of people, and Rip Ratson and others led them to save the art. It was also to provide for the pensions. So, so when you say there's a human dimension, pensions, Return to city to regular order, structuring our grants funding so that it operates fully. We don't. We lost. I think it was in excess of thirty million dollars at grants that we turned back in prior years, just because we weren't managing them appropriately. In the past year, we got twenty-seven million of our twenty twelve funds and thirty-five million of our twenty thirteen funds, just because we started to run our grants program appropriately. That is money that can be used for the human dimension. There, there are 66,000 pieces, 36,000 that actually owned outright. There are 2,500 that have been shown, and 400 of those are the most value that have been appraised. That 400, 5% accounts for 90% of the value. Of the other 66,000 pieces, some of it's broken jars and shards, stuff people have never seen and has no value in the marketplace. So the vast majority of the value of the art has been appraised. No, and I'll tell you why. Um, let's take Belle Isle, for instance. Uh, by a show of hands, who wants me to turn any part of Belle Isle into a gated community? Okay. 
I, I have heard from more people that that island, and I, re, you know, people say, you don't understand. I said, no, no, no. I grew up in the South. I grew up with both of my mothers were eighth grade educated names who went across town. My, my one grandmother, Theodora Jackson, walked the Seaboard Coastline Railroad track six miles over and six miles back to go work for the family over there, to prepare their dinner, come home, prepare her family's dinners, go back, clean up the house, and come back every day for 50 years, okay? I knew when my mother worked on Palm Beach, which they raised the bridges, and if you didn't have a pass uh, for your family when you were over there, the sheriff would, would arrest you for vagrancy until your employer came and bailed you out that night because they were sundown town. So when I see Belle Isle, I understand the history of Belle Isle more than a lot of people in Detroit understand the history of Belle Isle, okay? I understand the history of Detroit. And I don't think anyone wanted me to have a hand in making that an exclusive enclave, even a portion of it, for the wealthy. Now, let me, let me respond to your question. Could I have done that? I could have sold it. I could have sold 100,000 waterfront, because it's an island, it's all this waterfront. I could have sold 100,000 waterfront acres to a Russian oligarch, Brazilian millionaire, um, Saudi prince, whoever, at say, let's say waterfront property on average goes for $250,000 a quarter acre. So I could have sold 100,000 acres at a bid of a million dollars an acre. That would have raised a lot of money. 